Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches is bringing in some tender perennials by propagating them through cane cuttings and pups. We test and regulate the water pressure in our hydrants and irrigation systems. Shelly Mitchell has a fun kids project building mazes for plants. And Barbara Brown cooks sautéed Brussels sprouts. this season, we looked at how to propagate coleus through stem cuttings in order to overwinter them and bring them in. Today we're looking at another annual and how to propagate it. This is purple sugarcane. It's a plant that we like to grow here in our children's garden each year. One, to teach children that sugar actually does come from a plant. And also we like the purple version just because it adds a little color into our garden here. Now sugarcane, as you can see, can easily reach eight feet in one season. And as it grows, it kind of becomes cumbersome to think about having to dig this plant up to overwinter. As a tropical though, it will die out each winter if we don't do something about it. Now this is a monocot, as you can tell, with the parallel veins in the leaves, and it is a cane. And so you'll notice these rings that are on the stems, if you will, of the plant. So this is kind of similar to uh, stem cuttings, but the one thing that we're going to note is these rings that are on the cane. We're going to actually harvest just one cane and take several cuttings from it. And you can see that these rings are where we're going to get the adventitious growth, both from the stem and the roots. And in fact, this is sort of doing it already here on this stem that is still attached to the main plant. You can see right here we've got another bud that's starting to break here and then we have some adventitious roots that are starting to develop down here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and harvest one of these canes. Rather than digging up this whole plant, we're just going to harvest one of these canes in order to take some cuttings from it. So you can see here where we've cut our canes for propagation purposes. In warmer clients, climates where they're actually trying to harvest the cane for sugar production, a lot of times they'll take more than one cut. And you can see the shoot that's regrowing here. And this is actually known as a ratoon. So this agriculture practice where you harvest the crop and then have a second regrowth is known as ratooning. Now it depends on the climate as to how many harvests that you can get off of a crop. But the initial crop that they planted is known as the seed crop, the main crop, or the principal crop. And then the harvest that comes off of the ratoon is known as the first ratoon, the second ratoon, and so on and so forth. Now this is an agriculture practice that's often used in monocots with um, both sugarcane, bananas, and rice. And it's actually a practice that dates back to the 1700s in China, so it's been used for centuries. We've got one more annual that we're going to show you how we overwinter it as the season begins to end. And this is the Calocasia mojito. Now, a lot of these can be marginal, especially in southern Oklahoma, so you might really be able to mulch them heavily and they actually overwinter. We've had a couple of them overwinter here in Stillwater, which is in north central Oklahoma. But just to be sure, because we never know how our winters can be, we want to go ahead and bring a couple in. Um, now you can see how, again, large they can get by the end of the season. So what we're going to do is propagate this through division. And basically that means we're going to dig one up, 
So you can see how large the plant gets and we're not really worried about the, the big plant, but what we're looking for is just to harvest some of these smaller plants. Again, we're gonna divide this from the main crown of the plant and we'll pot these up in order to overwinter them for this spring. So once we've harvested our plant material, it's time to actually do the propagation. So we're going to go back to our canes here, um, and I'm going to show you two different methods that you can do. So again, we're looking at these growth rings that are on the cane. You can see how we've got some that are already actually creating roots here, and then there are a couple of buds that will be future shoots. So there's a, a couple of different ways of doing this. We're going to just go ahead and start by uh, taking a cutting of this. And you're going to need some pretty good loppers to cut through this cane. And then we're going to cut down below. We want to at least get two of those rings in this. So one method of doing this is to actually take the whole cutting and put one ring below the ground and one ring above the ground um, or the potting soil that you're using. So the ring that's below the ground is going to have adventitious roots that develop off of it, and that's going to become your new root system. The ring that is above the ground will start to produce more shoots and leaves, or also what is called rotunes, where those shoots develop from the stem growth. And so this will be a new plant for us next spring. Now again, the bigger the plant uh, container you put it in, or the more cuttings you put in here, the larger plant you will have to put out next spring. Another method of propagating these canes um, through cane cuttings is to go ahead and take a cutting that just has one ring on it. And for this particular one, we're going to go ahead and just actually place it halfway in the soil on its side. Now, if you know about the xylem and the phloem system, that might seem a little uh, against what we know as far as the fluids moving through the plant. But what's going to happen here is, the, again, the adventitious roots are going to develop on the bottom half of this ring, and the vegetative growth is going to develop on the top half of this ring. And we have an example of this here, as we've got some that have already started growing. So you can see how much um, the roots have started to develop and are growing down. And in fact, they're already growing out of our little container here. And then we've got some rotunes or shoots that are developing off of this cane. So obviously they're not going to um, grow all winter long in this container. Um, this is just a container to kind of get them established. And then once, we'll, once they're established, we will pull this out and replant it into a larger container. So the next form of asexual propagation is division. And this is probably one of the most popular forms of propagation for many homeowners with their perennials um, because it's simply going in and dividing your plant up. So in this case, we're doing it because we want to overwinter the smaller portion of our plant. And so we're just going to take some of these pups that we've harvested off of the mother plant um, and pop them up. Now again, you want to make sure that you put it in the size of a container that can handle it as it continues to grow throughout those winter months. Um, but you can see here, we've got one here that's already taken off and really starting to fill up that pot as this one will continue to do. The nice thing about calicaceous is they really appreciate a lot of water. So you can actually um, get a container that doesn't have holes in it um, and set this container inside of it and just fill it up with an inch or two of water sort of creating a, a bog container garden inside your house. And so it really works well as a house plant. You don't, you don't have to worry about overwatering it too much. So whether you're doing stem cuttings, cane cuttings, or division, these are all great methods of propagation to get your garden started next spring.
Many times our home irrigation system has really good water pressure. Sometimes it has very low water pressure. Have you ever wondered how you might be able to check that? Well, here's a neat little tool to do that. So basically this is a water pressure gauge and it's really simple. You just take it and you can screw it into the faucet on your home or out here we have a faucet out in the yard. So you can screw it in. You can look at it. It's got a dial on it and it basically goes from zero to 200 PSIs. So that's a measurement of pressure, pounds per square inch. And you can turn it on and see what your pressure is. On this one, it's getting close to 80 PSIs. And you might think, well, what, what does that tell me? So a lot of times a home irrigation system, uh, like a sprinkler, may be designed to run at 30 or 40 PSIs. So if your measurement is well above that, like here, we're almost twice that amount, we're up at 80 PSIs, what will happen is you'll turn on the sprinkler from this faucet, and actually the pressure is so high that the water droplets become almost like a vapor and they just float away in the wind. And then the water doesn't go where you want it to go, which is to your plants. And so how might you deal with that? Well, what you can do is you can put on pressure regulation either for your irrigation system, if you have a in-ground irrigation system, or if you have a, a water hose, you may be able to buy a sprinkler to attach to that water hose that will actually have a little pressure regulation gauge on it. Now, is that realistic that we could find something? It is realistic that we can do that, but let's say we're just gonna, you know, get a water hose and sprinkler from, from the uh, home department store in our, in our hometown. And so what we wanna do is really go ahead and hook up the water hose, put this at the end of the water hose and see what you're getting. If it's too high, just keep that in mind. And really probably the only way you can combat that is maybe hook up two sprinklers to that water hose, get a splitter. And what will happen is that will help to, with, with there being more lines and more sprinklers, reduce that pressure at each sprinkler head. So easy way to test it. We have a nice fact sheet that talks about this. Take a look at that. And then if you want to ask a professional how you might deal with that in your proper in-ground irrigation system, if you have the sprinkler and the water hose, think about how you might deal with that problem. Maybe that's putting two water sprinklers instead of one. So if you have a irrigation system like this where you're basically just hooking this up and say putting it on a drip line to one of your landscape beds, it's really important to put pressure regulation there and you can actually get it in line, you know, in between here and your water hose, put a pressure regulator that will go from like 80 PSIs here and drop it down to say low pressure like 20 PSIs before it goes into your drip line into your landscape bed. And that's very important. If, if we were to just hook that up to 80 PSI, it might actually just blow up the drip line directly. So we have to put that pressure regulation on first so we don't do that. Also, if you have an in-ground system in your home, maybe it was professionally installed and you're just wondering what the pressure is, there are little tools. There's another little tool here, which is the same type of pressure gauge, except on this one, it has a little tube. You would actually kick on the sprinkler, the in-ground sprinkler, put this little tube in the stream that comes out of the sprinkler and you could actually measure the pressure at the head. And for more information, check out a great fact sheet we have that deals with pressure regulation in the home sprinkler system. Today we're going to talk about phototropism. Plants exhibit movement toward and away from different stimuli in the environment. Sometimes it's toward or away from gravity, sometimes toward or away chemicals, and we're going to talk about going to or from light today. So the response to light that, that plants exhibit is called phototropism, which comes from the root words photo, which means light, and tropism, which means movement. So the top part of plants above ground move toward light and the bottom parts, the roots, go away from light. So when you're growing plants, if it's outside and there's light all the way around, the plant will grow straight up. If there's only light from one direction, the plant will turn toward the light. Now exactly what is going on and how does the plant know to do that? 
which that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to show a demonstration of it happening and we're going to show you how to make your own little plant maze to demonstrate it to your friends. So what we have today is I have taken some boxes and I have made, and I'm going to show you that in a minute, I have made, this is basically the inside view of one of the boxes. So this is vertical and we have different cardboard pieces that are coming out of the inside of the box. So what happens is the plant starts to grow up and it's like, nope, nope, that's dark. So it turns and the way it turns is the outer edge of the stem elongates their cells faster than the, side, than the side that has the light coming from it. So what happens is there's a plant hormone called auxin and it helps elongate cells. That's the stuff that you get in um, root hormones when you're taking cuttings of plants and you want to grow roots. It's got a lot of auxin which helps cells elongate. Well in this case the auxin migrates to the outside part of the stem and makes those cells grow longer. So when you have those cells growing longer, it's going to force the cells to turn, the plant stem to turn. So it's going along and it's headed towards the light. Well now, it's starting to see the dark corner. And the light's not coming from over here, the light's coming from over here. So now, the side that was growing faster is going to slow down and the other side is going to catch up and the plant is going to turn this way. And then we get to the dark side and the plant sees the lights over here and it goes this way. And so as it goes towards dark, the side that's on the dark side speeds up. So it makes making the plant turn towards the light. And so eventually it finds its way towards where the sun is shining or the light is shining. So it has to grow from a seed that just germinated. It has to make its way all the way through this, but it knows where the light is. And so the dark side is growing faster and that's what helps it turn. Now, this is a long way to go. And so I usually use beans as the seeds because they have more energy than let's say like a piece of lettuce. Besides the lettuce is not usually gonna do this. So I use bean seeds. So I did a few experiments to show you guys what happens. Now, when you make a little plant maze, you want to make sure that only the only light they see is from up here. If they see light over here, they're just going to stay over there. So you have to make sure the light is only coming from one source and they can't see it from any other direction. So that's why I put aluminum foil around this little plant maze. This is one that you can buy, it's already made. And so I put aluminum around it so that the only, only light is coming from the top. Now I'll show you what happened behind the aluminum foil. Okay, what happened is I planted some seeds and they germinated. And as the light was only from the top, they eventually worked their way up and I had set up a maze. So it physically can't go anywhere but up towards the light. And so even though I put some obstacles in its path, it still grew towards the light. So it had to make some twists and some turns and some of them were better at doing that than others. But you can see that eventually, even after, after having to go around some turns, the plant found the light. Now, you can buy one of these that's ready-made, but you can do just as well with the homemade one. So I'll show you some of the ones I made at home. So here's one I made, and again, aluminum foil to minimize light coming from anywhere, but up at the top here, this is where the light was coming from. So, this is where the plant started from and the light was only coming from the top. And so you can see one of the plants has gone through the maze. 
all the way to the top. Now, apparently the uh, little door wasn't shut perfectly, and one of the plants decided to go straight towards the light without going through the maze. So it kind of cheated. I mean, for my purposes, it cheated. After you finish assembling your plant maze, be sure to put it near a window or under a lamp so that the light can get to the bottom. You can open the little door and check on them every couple days, but in about a week, you should see little leaves poking out the top. So this is a fun little experiment you can do at your own house with handy materials to demonstrate phototropism in action. Brussels sprouts are one of my favorites and today we're going to use them again in another recipe. Uh, this is sauteed Brussels sprouts with onions and garlic and it's really easy to do uh, after you get by step number one. Now I did all of these by hand. This is a pound of shredded or slivered Brussels sprouts, uh, one sliver at a time. And if you're using a sharp knife, it's great and it worked fine and I didn't mind it. Uh, a food processor might speed it up. I tried a mandolin and that didn't seem to work very well. The leaves kept catching in it, but if you've got better skill at a mandolin, uh, you might want to try that instead too. The other option is in some supermarkets, they actually sell them this way. Uh, and if you don't have them in your garden and you're going to go buy them anyway, you might look because it could save you some time. This actually, uh, as I said, it's not that big a deal. What you do need to look at though, is as you, you cut off the bottoms of them and then look over them to, to remove any of the leaves that uh, aren't good. Sometimes when I cut them in, under normal spaces, uh, for normal uses or other uses, uh, I find that there's bug damage or insect damage or other kinds of things in there. So you want to make sure that you look them over as you're preparing them uh, so you don't move that along and, and include any insects in the food chain. Okay, I've got my skillet warming up over medium-high heat. I'm going to add two tablespoons of oil to this. Um, I'm using a olive oil. You could use any other kind of oil. I like the flavor in this one uh, from the olive oil. Then when that gets hot, hopefully it will be, in, we'll assume it's hot now, uh, we're going to add about a cup of onion, either a medium onion or half of a large onion to that. Stir that around and let everything get coated and then we're going to let those uh, cook for about three minutes. Okay, when your onion is starting to become translucent, there's a lot of cooking left to go, so you don't have to cook it completely. Go ahead and add one clove of garlic that you've minced. Get that out of there. And let this go for about 30 seconds. We want to start the cooking on the garlic, but we don't want to have anything uh, scorching on the garlic, which happens really easily. So uh, I think that's, we'll count that as 30 seconds. And then we're going to add our Brussels sprouts. Now this looks like a lot, it is a pound, but because uh, there's a lot of moisture in here and the walls of the, the Brussels sprouts are gonna start to collapse as it cooks, it's going to cook down quite a bit, so it's not gonna look quite, quite as much as it does. The recipe says it makes four servings. It seems like I'm giving away too much if it's me that's eating it, but for a lot of people it's four servings, maybe even six as a side dish. Uh, so take that into consideration. You could easily cut this in half if you wanted to after you tried it the first time if, you, if it was too much. Uh, I'm also going to add a half a teaspoon of kosher salt. Try to spread that around. And a fourth of a teaspoon of black pepper. See if I can get that to go in the pan and not with the breeze. And keep stirring. Now this is going to continue. You're going to continue to saute, which doesn't mean that it has to be cooked and stirred all the time. It just has to cook all the time. So uh, every couple of minutes come back. It's five to 10 minutes on the cook until you get it down to the point where you want it. If you like Brussels sprouts so they're really soft and melty in your mouth, then go for the 10. If you like them so that they have a little bit more bite to them, go for even four minutes. So uh, just test it from time to time and see where you are. If it is, ends up being more than you want, it works re really nicely uh, in something like a stir fry. If you have everything else and you're cooking, then you could stir this in towards the end just so it gets hot. 
uh, adds a lot of flavor. Uh, so you can be a little bit creative with what you do if you, if you happen to have leftovers. I really haven't run into the problem yet. I think this is about the way I want it. I don't want it so soft uh, that I don't get that texture. Uh, I don't want it too crunchy either, uh, but I want it to retain its color. And so I'm gonna stop cooking at this point and we'll serve up some, again, this is Brussels sprouts sauteed Brussels sprouts with onion and garlic. I hope you'll give it a try. It's really awesome in the fall. Uh, nothing quite like a big plate of uh, Brussels sprouts and some fish or, or beef or pork to go with it. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. Next week, Casey will look at the source of the bell-bottom blues, and she'll cotton to cotton. We'll explore the world of textiles and dyes, and Shelly Mitchell will have another plant relationship. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.